Sorry about that. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Great to be here. If you will open your Bibles with me, please, this morning to Psalm 122. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark, yes, but let's open to Psalm 122 first. And there's a reason for that. What a blessing to see what the Lord did with 37 men being there yesterday. That wasn't counting. Uh, Mike Ritter and I were there. We didn't play golf, but we had a great time um, sitting and watching for a while. And so really about 40 men. And then we heard some more came later. So that's almost twice what we've gotten in the last few years. So just good to see what the Lord is doing. And it's him. And then listening to the buzz in here as you talk to each other and you come in and the excitement and just the life. And we know it's the Lord and he's doing it and it's his presence. And before we read this, Someone um, blessed everyone, and they want to remain anonymous, brought a bunch of apples and buckets over here with plastic bags afterwards for anyone who wants them. And so please help yourself, and, and uh, let's make those disappear today after service. And um, man, so much going on. Were you drawn into that video like I was? Wasn't that so good? Just drew me in and like spoke to my heart and just felt like the Holy Spirit filled us afresh just watching that about the Lord and um, what he does <laughs> in people's lives and with everything going on. That's really what it's all about. Amen. Amen. I was thinking, I don't know if you've ever sent a shoebox. A shoebox is just representative of anything you ever do for the Lord in obedience to him. And we talked about this before. Heaven is going to be just forever with the Lord going to be incredible and glorious. But one of the things that's going to be amazing and is all the people you and I will meet that will be thanking you and we'll be thanking them too. And you'll be going, I've never met you. Why are you thanking me? And it's because they're there forever because God did it all, but he happened to use you. And so let's just take the shoe boxes. And we saw the little girl inviting her friend and inviting her grandma and bringing them to church. And then all these people lining up who sent that shoebox? So if you've ever sent a shoebox and God's had us as his church here doing that for like the last 13 years every year. Um, if you've ever sent one, then where do they all go? And where are those people now, those kids that got them? And how many people have come to know the Lord? And you know what I'm trying to say? It just snowballs. And then everyone, and God's going to give us that knowledge and we're going to know. And it's going to be amazing to see what he did with simple obedience to little things he would give us to do. And so that's all day long, every day, whatever he leads you and I to do. We're in Psalm 122, and we're going to open reading this because of what's going on in Israel this morning. And if you're not aware, early Saturday morning, Hamas um, surprise attack, and they did surprise Israel with an attack, and they came into Gaza and uh, they came, uh, they set off explosions and they broke through the barriers and a lot of men came in and, and they came and they shot rockets and they were coming by sea and it was a planned attack, took them by surprise. And so this morning I was looking at the news to get an update and um, 600 or more uh, people have been killed in Israel and over 2,000 wounded, and they took hostages. They took women, children, elderly hostage. And so fighting has been going on since then, and there have been over 300 killed in Gaza on the other side, and 
I don't know how close this is, 2,000 wounded also. And so there's war going on in Israel right now this morning. Now, Irit and Steve attend our fellowship here, and she's from Israel, um, and her folks are here visiting, and they've been here for about a month now, it seems. They've never been to the U.S., and they have family over there, and she's put that on the prayer chain, and we're praying for them. Can you imagine if your family was over there, and there's war, and and so um, Irit has a cousin called up to duty. I don't know if you were here uh, this past year when her friend Yael came, and they both worshiped together up here, and they sang in Hebrew. That was so beautiful. And Yael has a, a brother who's in the reserves who's serving now, and they have friends from the church in Jerusalem who are in the military that are operating right now as we speak in, in fighting in, in that area, in Gaza. And so um, we heard from Irit, uh, you know, through the, the grapevine that they, uh, the next day after we heard about the attack, that they were up all night praying and they were, um, they were praying um, Psalm 122. So you guys, as we pray, let this be our prayer. And if you'll read it with me, it says, The joy of going to the house of the Lord, and that was the temple in Jerusalem. And it says, I was glad, David wrote this, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord to the testimony of Israel. Do you see how that's capitalized? That's God. To give thanks to the name of the Lord, for thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Lord, we pray. We thank you for Israel. Lord Jesus, Israel is your nation, Lord. You were born in Israel and walked there, and you are the Savior of the whole world. We thank you for the Jewish nation, Lord, your plan, and your plan was to bring the salvation to us Gentiles through the Jewish nation, Lord. We pray for the fighting, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem right now, Lord, and ask you to protect whatever's going on this moment over there. Comfort the families and the friends of all those who have lost loved ones and have injured, and we pray for their healing. And we pray, Lord, that you would give the leaders wisdom. We pray for um, Irene and her family, her parents, and everyone they know, Lord, who's serving right now. And Lord, we know you're coming soon. And so, Lord, we pray for what's going on in the world, Lord. So we just thank you, Lord, for your word as we look at you, Jesus, in your word this morning. Thank you for what you're doing around the world. As that's going on, Lord, we see the video of what you're doing through the shoe boxes. We're here. We just praise you, Lord, that you are so much greater, so much higher, so much stronger. so almighty that our mind can't even grasp how powerful you are, Lord, and how much you are in control, even if it wouldn't seem like it, Lord, and even in our own lives. And we praise you, Lord, that in the midst of this world, it's as if, Lord, because you're God and you can do everything, we have you all to ourself alone, so that when we need you in our own small lives, Lord, and we turn to you. Your full attention is upon us, God, and you watch over us and your eyes never leave. 
and you love us and you meet our needs. So we praise you for who you are this morning, Lord. May you be lifted high and glorified. And we pray for the salvation of Israel, Lord, that those that don't know you yet there on both sides, Lord, would come to know you for you died for the sins of the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. This morning we look, um, okay, so let's turn, I'm sorry, to Mark chapter 8, verse 27. And we've been going through the gospel of Mark. So Mark chapter 8, verse 27. And we're at a point uh, in the gospel where in Mark's gospel here, it's about six months, just a, a little over six months away, Jesus is going to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. Bethsaida, we've seen our story. He's on the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee with the disciples. He's been ministering to great crowds of people. And what we see now and we'll see for the rest of the gospel is the Lord knows he's going to the cross and then he's going to die and he's going to be resurrected and the church is going to be born and the apostles are going to go out and the men he's training. So what he's really going to do is focus in and spend time with them now. And he'll minister to crowds and people still, but his focus is really going to be uh, leading them and teaching them and preparing them for what's ahead and so they leave the city of Bethsaida in our story this morning, our Lord and his disciples, and they travel about 25 miles north, going north from the Sea of Galilee in the north of Israel, till they come to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and that's sitting right at the foot of their base of Mount Hermon. And if you're at the Sea of Galilee, you can see Mount Hermon in the distance, and it's, and it's beautiful. And so that's where we pick it up. And it says in verse 27, now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi and on the road, he asked his disciples saying to them, who do men say that I am? So they answered John the Baptist, but some say Elijah and others, one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. Okay, wait a minute. We just saw a video about putting the gospel in shoeboxes and wanting everyone to know about him, and, and he wants everyone to know about him. And that's true right here also. What he's doing as God is he's controlling. Um, he's going to die on the cross. And when they arrest him, he said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. And, uh, and even you guys, when they come to arrest him, do you remember when Judas, you know, about six months from the time we're in the story now, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane and Judas brings the great mob of soldiers with torches and lanterns and clubs and swords and they're going to arrest the Lord. And when they come up to arrest him, Jesus goes out to meet them. You guys, nothing could keep him from the cross. And if you remember... Um, he says to them, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. Well, you know the name I am is the name of God in the Old Testament. Jesus was in the midst of the burning bush and he told Moses when he said, when I go to lead your people out of Egypt, who should I tell them sent me? And he said, tell them I am sent you. And then seven times in the gospels, Jesus said, I am, right? I'm the bread of life, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He said it seven times. I am the resurrection and the life. Well, when they came out to arrest him and they said, who are you? And he said, Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And when he said, I am he, if you can imagine a huge group of hundreds of men armed to the teeth, boom, getting knocked on their rear end. And I mean, as if you're wrestling as a boy or playing football or you happen to get in a fight and you got the wind knocked out of you and you got the wind knocked out of you and you're like, huh, you got the wind knocked out of you. And this man who's an ordinary looking Israeli man that you and I would walk by on the street because he's almighty God in human flesh, but he came clothed in a human body, but 
There was nothing about him that we would be attracted to him. And he came that way purposely. Doesn't that just make you want to worship him? What a humble God. He did that because what was really the, the person we need to be drawn to is who he is inside. And yet we're so drawn on the outside to uh, outward things, you know, uh, looks and whatever. So you see pictures of the Lord as this very handsome man. That's not biblically true. Isaiah 53 tells him there was nothing is in, in appearance to attract us to it to him but oh yes we are so attracted to him and he draws all men to himself well what he did is he said i am he and he did it on purpose you guys he has all power he's controlling the universe right now he didn't even need the help of angels he said i could call 12 legions of angels right now peter put your sword away but he just let out a little bit of power to knock them down but why did he do that because then he waited, they came to their senses, they stood up, and he said, again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, now he holds that power, and he says, I told you I am he, but let these go their way, the other 11 disciples that were with him. With him. So why did he do what he did? To protect those, because he had said, I will lose none that God gave me. And you guys, that's the Lord that loves you and I. And so that's why he did that, because he got their attention, knocked them down, right? And now it's let these go their way, okay? Okay, right? And they take him. And then he goes to the cross. It says in verse 27, he asked them, his disciples, who do men say that I am? And the meaning here is that he, he kept on asking them. You guys, it wasn't just a real quick conversation he was spending time with them the same story in luke's gospel chapter 9 it says and it happened as he jesus was alone praying that his disciples joined him and he asked them saying who do the crowds say to that i am so it says here on the road and then it says he was praying so you get this beautiful picture of just jesus and his disciples again away from the multitudes, he's pouring himself into them, spending time alone with them the way he wants to spend with you and I every day of every week, right? And he's so near to us and he lives within our hearts. And they find him praying and we see that he was praying all the time. We're gonna talk about more of that, about that today. And he says, who do men say that I am? Luke says that he had said, who do the crowds say that I am? So notice in verse 28, we're going to see Peter give an answer, but first it says in 28, so they, and that of course means more than one disciple, they answered. Okay, that isn't going to mean that all together, one, two, three, they all said what we're going to read now in verse 28. It would mean different disciples, he's spending time with them, are going to give him different answers. So one disciple, whoever it is, says, hey, some people think you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah, others one of the prophets. Matthew, in his account, same story, chapter 16, one of them says, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then one of them, in Luke's account, in chapter 9, says, others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. So he's hearing all of this from them, but his real purpose is um, their heart. And he has a tendency to go straight to the heart when he talks with people. And so that's when he says to them in verse 29, and it means that he kept questioning them, you guys. It says, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? That's all important. Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Matthew, who was there, the tax collector, in chapter 16, same story, Matthew says that Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So that's a really bold and uncompromising confession of who Jesus is. Peter says, right, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Have you ever been that bold in your confession of him? We all have. I have been, right? Just bold, uncompromising, so easy for me to stand here and talk that way with you now. It's easier. 
What's harder is when we go out every day and live and we're surrounded by other people and this, that pressure from other people to fit in and whatever, are we that bold and that uncompromising? And by the way, the only way we ever are is the Holy Spirit who Jesus gave us and who lives within us, God himself. We will deny him. We will be fearful. We will be selfish. It will, but when anything good happens, it's the Lord and it's the Holy Spirit. The key is that we don't depend on ourselves and think we can do it, but we realize we can't and we completely depend on him and ask him to do it and then give him all the glory and point to him and keep pointing to him. And now that's what was so powerful about that video we watched is it was all about Christ and it was pointing to the Lord and everyone was being pointed to the Lord. And um, so again, just like when Jesus said, I am he, and all the soldiers fell down when they arrested him, he tells his disciples, right now, don't tell anyone that I am the son of God, the Messiah. Why? Because he's the one in control and he knows he's going to the cross and he knows that could get the multitudes going, right? You remember at one point we learned they wanted to come and take him king? Well, he's going to the cross first. So he kept on questioning them in verse 29. And you guys, he does the same today. So let's stop right now. And the living son of God, the risen Lord, our Lord, I believe all of the time in our lives, periodically, and maybe he's doing it in your life right now. He's doing it in mine, especially as we're here in the word of God and we're studying this and learning it. He'll say to you, just look what he did with his disciples. Well, here we are. We're his disciples. And he'll say, who do you say that I am? You, right? And it's individual. And he's with 12. But he meant all of you together, but he meant each of you individually. And so they're each giving an answer. But then it's like, okay, you told me what everyone else thinks. Who do you say that I am? And it isn't about what everyone else thinks about Jesus. It's about who you individually think he is and what you believe about him so he still does that today the meaning is it's beautiful he himself kept on questioning them don't you love that so you guys he himself knocks on your heart and says who do you say that i am and peter says you are the christ christ is the english spelling new testament is written in greek of the word Christos, which means the anointed one. And that is from a translation of the Hebrew word. That's what the Old Testament was written in. And that comes into our English in the word Messiah. So are you saying that in the Old Testament, Messiah and in the New Testament, Christ are the same thing, the anointed one? Yes. Messiah is Old Testament Hebrew. Um, Greek in the New Testament, Christ is Messiah, the anointed one. So Jesus Christ isn't his name. It's his title. It's who he is. I'm going to ask you to hold your place right there. We're going to come back. And if you'll turn with me to your right to Philippians chapter 2 at, and go to verse 5. Philippians 2, 5. Paul wrote this to the Philippian church. And as we're talking about in our heart and mind, who we think and believe the Lord is. And he himself asking us, who do you say I am? The battleground is our mind. By the way, um, spiritual warfare, there's an intensity in the world. In the Middle East, when Israel is attacked and this is going on, there's just an automatic intensity in the whole world. But there's an intensity here in Crescent City, and maybe there's a personal intensity in your own life. Um, my wife was telling me that just the last couple of days, just everything you know that's going on in your life and everyone else. You go, wow, it's ramping up. There's an intensity. Because we battle unseen um, forces in a spiritual war, Satan and all of his demons, right? And the weapons of our warfare are prayer and the word of God. And so things are escalating. By the way, what's ahead, you guys? Um, do you know, uh, I'm going to stop here for a minute. 
in the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, in chapter 38 and 39, we're told that Russia, and this has not happened yet, and all biblical scholars agree, Ezekiel 38 and 39 has not happened yet. Russia will come down from the north to Israel and invade Israel, and, uh, you know, Muslim nations that surround Israel, Arab nations, will gather with, and they will all attack Israel. And we read that. And what we read is God will supernaturally intervene and destroy those armies when that happens, the way he has done in the Old Testament. Okay, so now we see Israel at war over here. Is this going to be Ezekiel 38 and 39? Could be. We don't know. Um, the only problem I see is that Russia has seemed pretty tied up the last couple of years in Ukraine, and they still are. So they're not really in a position to invade Israel right now, you see. So what's possible, we don't know. But imagine this, and I really think it's very possible this is what's going to happen. The next thing that's going to happen is the rapture of the church where our Lord Jesus Christ catches all true believers up and takes us to heaven. That's first. That will bring complete chaos around the world with all of those people, believers going. It'll bring complete chaos. So imagine that happened right now in complete chaos. And with complete chaos in the world, now Russia and those nations taking advantage of that complete chaos say, let's go after Israel. And they invade <coughs> Israel. And they go after Israel. And the whole world sees that Israel is being attacked by Russia and those nations. And then they see God supernaturally destroy them that brings even more chaos. Oh my gosh, the world's in complete disorder. What's going on, right? What's the answer? What are we going to do? The whole world's changed. And a man rises up called the Antichrist, a man of peace, and, he, and he's the answer, and he's very eloquent, and he's energized with the Satan of power, uh, power of Satan, and he has a plan for one world government, and we see that already being set up. We also know that there's going to be a peace treaty, that Antichrist, with Israel for seven years. So that has to begin at the beginning of the tribulation period, because, which is seven years long, because three and a half years into that period, the Antichrist uh, goes into the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Jerusalem that's been rebuilt and demands to be worshipped as God. And that's when Israel's eyes are opened and they turn to their true Messiah, Jesus Christ, and all Israel is saved. So that temple has to be rebuilt. Now, right now, today, how could that temple be rebuilt? You'd have full-on war. But if the church is caught up in chaos, Russia comes down, God wipes out their army and those Arab nations' armies, there's now that, not that interference to rebuilding the temple because those Muslim nations and their armies, their armies have been immobilized or destroyed. And the Antichrist says, I have an idea for world peace. Let's help you rebuild your temple. And he helps them rebuild their temple and signs a peace treaty for seven years, you guys. At the end of that seven years is the second return of Jesus Christ, and we come back with him from heaven. All of that to say what we see going on as we're sitting in here right now this morning, what is going on on the other side of the world 10 hours away is a precursor. It could be Ezekiel 38 and 39, and it, it's not that it can't happen right now. But um, you guys, we're living in the last of the last days, and so we just need to be looking up and going, Lord, you're real, you're God. Everything always happens. Everything he has said in his word. And so you guys, we really need to focus on him and then focus on other people that they might know the Lord. Paul says, let this mind, Philippians 2.5, be in you. In other words, think this way, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name Jesus, which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I was reading in 1 Samuel this week about the Philistines going to war against Israel and them going out and the Ark of God, right? The Ark of the Testimony, they took to battle with them and it got captured and you go, wait a minute, that's where God dwelt. How did that happen? Well, that happened because they were looking at it more as a good luck charm, right? If we have the Ark with us, then we're sure to win when the ark represents who? God. They weren't looking to God. They were looking to this thing, this ark. God allowed it to be captured, but it is God's ark, and it did represent him. Anyway, they took it back, and what, what did they do? They put it in their temple to their god, Dagon, right? They brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod, that's the city, arose early in the morning, and they went in, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. In other words, that's your God. He just fell on his face, that statue, that big statue. So they propped him up again, right? They rose again early the next morning and went in. There was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, the head of Dagon on both and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso, or it's Dagon, I don't know, torso was left of it. Therefore, neither the priests of, of uh, Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Why am I reading that? Because we just read that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those on, under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And uh, who do you, disciples, who do you men say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You're the Son of God. It makes us think of Psalm 4610. Don't you love that? Be still and know that I am God. Wow, that's what's going on in our story. The Lord is opening their eyes. We usually don't read the other part of that verse, though. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And you guys, he's going to be. He's going to come and rule and reign for a thousand years on this earth. And then he's going to, the great white throne judgment will happen after his second coming after he's ruled here for a thousand years, and then he's going to destroy this present heaven and earth and create a new heaven and earth where we're going to dwell with him forever. And um, how can we be part of all of that? If we would receive him by believing that he's God and he died on the cross for our sins and that we can't save ourselves and we need to give our lives to him. We need to be able to say with Peter, you know, who do you say that I am? You're God. And you're my God, and I give my life to you. So let's go on. Um, and uh, and go to Mark eight thirty one. It says, and he began to teach them, and he's speaking about himself. That's a title for him, the Son of Man. That the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter. <laughs> but when he had turned around, Jesus, when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So you guys, he begins to teach them, um, the disciples, that he must do four things. In Matthew's same story in chapter 16, Jesus said that he must go to Jerusalem, and it's not included here. So that's number one, four things. Jesus is telling them, I must go to Jerusalem, right? So we're going to start heading that way. If you look at verse 31, number two, 
must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, number three, and be killed, and number four, after three days, rise again. And now he's really just, they, they can't make a mistake. He's being straight, clear, nothing is veiled. It says he spoke this word openly in verse 32. It means plainly, frank speech, unmistakably. So then Peter took him aside. And you guys, the idea is, imagine they're walking down the road and, and they're stopping or whatever. And the idea, and it's just Jesus and the disciples, is someone taking hold of another person so as to have him facing him. So if Jesus and the disciples, and, and they're all walking this way down the road, and Jesus is talking to them, and he tells them as they're walking that he's going to die and suffer, and we're going to Jerusalem, right? And now they're hearing this really clearly for the first time. It's as if what Peter does, he then kind of takes a couple quick steps in front of the Lord, or up next to the side of the Lord and he grabs him and he turns him around like this. It's to forcibly take someone so that you're looking them in the eye. And that's the picture and the meaning here of what's going on. And then he starts to rebuke the Lord and it's a really strong word meaning to reprove someone, censure them or warn in order to prevent an action from happening. Matthew says this, that Peter also said, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Well, look at verse 33 with me again. It says, but when he, Jesus, had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter even more strongly than Peter did, saying, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. And the meaning here when it says Jesus had turned around, he quickly wheeled around on Peter and faced the other disciples. So we don't know exactly what happened, but they stop. Peter goes around in front of him. He's saying this to Jesus. He tries to take him aside. And they would have had a private conversation. The Lord does that with you and I, except they must have overheard what Peter said, and he's rebuking Jesus. So Jesus now has to correct Peter so in front of everyone so that they can also hear so imagine now jesus doing the same thing and wheeling around so that he's now facing peter looking him in the eyes and the disciples and when he has everyone's attention he says to peter get behind me satan matthew says the lord also said you are an offense to me for you are not mindful of the things of god but the things of men now, you guys, Peter just said, I believe in you. You're the son of God. He's saved, right? So Jesus, when he says, get behind me, Satan, he's not saying that Peter's now unsaved. He had already confessed his faith in the person and the work of Jesus. What's happening here also is not, listen carefully, it's not that Jesus is calling Peter Satan. You're Satan, Peter. He's not saying that. You know what the Lord's doing? He can see the unseen and... Where's the battleground happen? In our mind. He can see what's going on in the unseen world and who is behind what Peter is saying and who is giving him those thoughts. And so his rebuke is to Satan who was there. Get behind me, Satan. And Peter is included in that rebuke. Jesus is never going to call you or I or one of his children or his disciples Satan. But the enemy, Satan, was the one who's influencing Peter at this point. And you guys, again, we can be really bold for the Lord and really strong and then fail. Um, we, like Peter, can say, who are you? Who do you say I am? Lord, you're, you're God. You're the Son of God. You're the Messiah. And then turn around and have thoughts that are completely like, Lord, don't go to the cross, and that's coming from the enemy, Satan, and have the Lord correct. So we go, yeah, Peter's always doing this, but you know what, we need to stop as we read the word of God and be honest and go, you know what, the Lord shows me, and he shows you that I'm very much like Peter, and I'm just like Peter, and I need to be careful, and so do you, and we need to really stay close to the Lord and trust him and his Holy Spirit and not ourselves, and realize and remember we are in a battle it has intensified 
everyone in here is a target. He's trying to pull us into temptation, pull us into sin, pull us down, discourage us, defeat us, destroy us, bring dark thoughts, desperate thoughts, um, keep us from sharing our faith or being used to help anyone else. Um, get so busy that we don't even remember, you know, the Christmas boxes and whatever. Oh, it's a great thought. And then an intention, you see, and that's just a, you know, a smaller thing, but that's what the enemy is trying to do. Now, we know the story. They don't know. Now imagine you're Peter and you know he's the Messiah. And he says he's going to go die on the cross, but they don't understand about him dying for the sins of the world yet and rising again. Why don't you just take your Messiah, take the throne now, right? Get rid of Rome and rule. That's what they're hoping. Everyone is. And so Jesus' death did not seem necessary to Peter. And uh, the Lord says, you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And that word mindful means to be of one's party or to side with him or to direct one's mind to do a thing. And we just read that the Holy Spirit said through Paul, let the mind of Jesus be in us where we would humble ourselves and be completely obedient to the Lord. And right here, to be mindful, Jesus says, you're being mindful. The enemy is putting these thoughts in your mind and you're running with it. It's as if you're with him. I mean, we had all these men's, they, they had teams yesterday, right? Divided into teams. So you're on your, your golf team, right? So that means you were mindful with those guys. You're of the same party. You're siding with him. And uh, it's to direct your mind to do one thing. Your whole team is doing one thing. So just stop because we see him and in one moment he's confessing the Lord and the other. And if you found yourself able to do the same thing in, in any given day, and by the way, the greatest time we all fail and fall is when there's been a great victory that only the Lord can bring very close to him. We experience him. We see him move in power. It's great or whatever. Really dangerous time because we kind of go, oh, we're just going to cruise on this like riding a wave and and oh man, it's just great. And it's going to be this way from here on out. This is going to last. And then here comes the attack, like the surprise attack on Israel. And they didn't even know it was coming and they didn't even see it. And here comes the enemy with something we thought would never affect us that way. So you guys, we just to be, need to be alert. And um, so let's look at verse 34. So Jesus first, right, asks them, who am I to you? You're the son of God, right? And uh, then he says, I'm going to go to the cross and die and rise again. And now he says, when he had called the people to himself with the disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels will save it. I like Matthew because in the same story, he says he'll find it. He'll find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? So you guys, our Lord says this to you and I this morning. He said it to them. Really, this is the heart of the Christian walk. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where you and I live every day. This is where things go forward and we draw closer to the Lord or we're drawn away from him. It's right here in this verse. This is it. And so what does Jesus say in verse 34? Whoever desires to come after me, do you desire to do that? Yes, we do, Lord. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Do you know what it means? Set aside our own will and our own rights to our own life. Forget our own self. Lose sight of ourself and our interests. And it also means that we enter into a brand new condition and a brand new state. In other words, when we give our heart to the Lord, here was our condition. But now we give our heart to the Lord in saving faith. And we enter into this verse right then and there immediately. There's a new condition. And the new condition is... Immediately, he calls us to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. Do you, you know, I love Luke's account because Luke adds that little word daily. Deny yourself and take up your cross 
daily. Yesterday's gone, tomorrow isn't here, but every day we need to do that and follow me. Follow me means to submit yourself completely to the will of Jesus, whatever it involves. And um, you know what's beautiful? They're walking down the road, right? And they're walking with him. Do you picture the Lord walking down the road and he's out front and they're always behind him and he doesn't look back? No. You know what? We picture the Lord walking down the road with, in, in our story today with his disciples and as they're walking, traveling, maybe some of them take out up front, some of them around him talking. There might be some guys coming up the rear talking to each other, but they were around him all the time and comfortable with him. He says, here, come after me. Uh, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. And the idea and the meaning here is so beautiful. It's not that of following behind, follow me, following behind another Jesus, but of accompanying that person, taking the same road that he takes and fellowshipping with him along that road. So when you and I deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, it's as if He's living his life in and through you and I, and, we, and he's walking with us. The following him means I'm with you. We're doing this together. You're going to experience my power in your life. You know, what we try to do is save our life. You know, it's all about me, and we want to be comfortable in this life and happy and all of these things, and um, we'll lose our life. But if we'll lose that and we'll deny ourselves, give our life to him, we'll follow him, we'll be saved. But he says we'll find our life. Doesn't seem to make sense. It's kind of like being drawn into that video and all these people serving. Were you, you're drawn to the kids. They need the Lord and their parents. I was also drawn in, how about you, to all those people serving. They were free. They were happy. They were filled with joy. Why? Because the focus went from this to self, to this, and outward and serving. And when we do that, we enter in to the Lord. He lives his life through us, and he sets us free. And we experience going back and forth from that every day. I do. How about you? And, uh, and that's what's going on. Now, when Jesus says, come after me and take up the cross, the meaning here, that's to be obeyed at once. So, Lord, I'm giving my heart to you today. First time I've ever given my heart to you. As we're believing, the meaning is we're coming after him and we're taking up our cross. The meaning here is that that's to happen at once. It's a once for all act, like getting saved. And then the meaning is it's supposed to be our total permanent attitude and the practice of our life so that the habit of our life is coming after him every day now and taking up our cross and being willing to do his will. And then counting it that our life has been given over. My life isn't mine anymore. We belong to the Lord. We are his property. And um, we continue day by day. So let me read it to you. You know, a Greek scholar kind of wrote it this way, paraphrased, um, Kenneth Wiest, and he said, as if Jesus is speaking, listen, he says, anyone desiring to come after me as a follower of mine, let him at once begin to take up his cross and let him start taking the same road in company with me and let him continue to do so moment by moment. That is the real true Christian life. We got challenged yesterday. Um, John shared the, the word, the devotion in the morning and he shared his testimony and he Share the gospel. And it was the Holy Spirit. And there were men there that don't know the Lord yet. And there were men there that know him. And we were all challenged to do what the Lord is calling the disciples to do today. To really follow him. Take stock of our life. Get rid of anything that's hindering us and hurting us. But man, those didn't, don't, didn't know him yet. Jesus was drawing them to himself to give their heart to him and planting seeds. It was a blessing. And um, do you know, uh, the Holy Spirit in you and I completely changes our life. These guys for three years, up until the night Jesus was arrested, they're arguing about 
who is the greatest among them, if you can believe that. And the Lord would catch them doing that. I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. When Matthew writes his gospel, he was one of them. But he writes it after Jesus died and rose from the dead and the church is born and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. So when Matthew takes up his pen and writes his gospel, he kept Matthew himself out of sight. He told what Peter and Andrew did, but he called himself in his gospel, Matthew the tax collector. And he tells how they all left to follow Jesus, but he doesn't ever mention the fact that he gave a big feast in his home for Jesus. He doesn't include that, and he's the one who did it. What happened? I'm the greatest. And we're fighting over who's the greatest, and only God can do it, because that's who we are. Do you ever have a, a hard time as a believer? You're saved and you know the Lord. Sometimes I end up back there. And the Lord will let you get there. He doesn't leave us, forsake us. We're saved and he doesn't leave our heart. But if we start walking on our own, he'll let us experience what that's like. And it's worse than we even remember. And we've got to be reminded of that every time. So that then when he takes over and we allow him to fill us and he uses us and we experience that, we have a hundred percent surety that it's the Lord and nothing happens without the Lord and it's him and all praise to you, Lord. And man, this is, uh, this is true joy just to make it all about Jesus. Amen. And so the gospel we're in, Mark, right? Um, we believe, uh, everyone believes Peter relayed the gospel to Mark and Mark wrote it. And, uh, and you know what? So Peter's telling the story to Mark that we're reading. Um, doesn't talk about him walking on the water in this gospel. And, um, and yet damaging things about Peter are, uh, are shared, how he denied the Lord, right? So Peter puts himself down in the gospel, lifts others up. Luke writes his gospel, he keeps out of sight. His name isn't found as the author in either Luke or Acts, which he wrote in John, covers himself in the gospel, doesn't use his name, always calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. So we see this radical change. So question as we wind down and close here, how are you and I, because we have this old nature that lives inside, but God lives inside of us now, our new nature, we're born again and saved and the Holy Spirit fills us. But we're called to deny that old man and crucify that flesh every day and let God rule and reign and live his life in us. And that's the battle we fight every day. So how do you and I subdue the pressures of our flesh that drive us to act out of our own self-interest and not to act self-sacrificially? And the answer is by the power of the Holy Spirit to look to the Lord and say, Lord, this has to be by your power. Fill me. Um, you know, I, I love, you probably do too, you watch a fire burn. You're sitting, imagine the Lord and disciples sitting around the campfire, right, that night. And as they're sitting there and you got a fire going, it's just fun to watch a fire burn. It's relaxing. But you see it pop or whatever, those sparks go up in the air, you know, and then they burn out in the smoke. Job says in chapter 5, verse 7, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. In other words, there's going to be trouble in our life. Well, this blind Scottish pastor, George Matheson, said this. He's in heaven now. This world is a place where human beings are taught to climb. In other words, who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. No, I am. I am. You guys, we're, we live in a world, and we have pride in our old nature that needs to be crucified. And the world says, climb. He goes on, and he says, but really the answer is to climb down. And he says, the book... The writer of the book of Job says, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. He says, I think he must have meant man is born to fly upward like the sparks, and therefore he is troubled. At all events, that is true. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying the trouble we have in our life is from that pride and that old nature. We, we, we want to go up, and the Lord leads us down and to humble ourselves and go low. He says this, 
Like the sparks, I have been born to fly upwards and to leave my brother behind. I'm the greatest. No, I am. Remember the video, to leave my brother behind, not to do that, right? George Matheson says, like the sparks, I have been born to fly upwards and to leave my brother behind. He says, I need a second birth, a power to fly downward. I need more weight on my wings. And you guys, that is the Holy Spirit, God himself, who lives within you and I. And so, um, you know what? One more verse. Let's close. Look with me at Mark 8, 38. For whoever is ashamed of me, Jesus said, and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with his holy angels. Notice whoever is ashamed. You know, it's speaking of someone who doesn't believe in Jesus, someone's present attitude, someone who isn't saying you are the son of God and placing faith in in him, but Jesus says he'll be ashamed of that person. But I believe what the Lord wants me to share as we close is what the Apostle Paul said. So you look at Paul. Do you notice as you read Paul's letters, he's always asking, please pray for me for boldness to preach the gospel. I need it. And I need the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, For I am not ashamed in Romans 1:16 of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Yeah, Paul, we know you're the bold apostle. You're not ashamed. Why does he say, I am not ashamed of the gospel? He writes to Timothy, young pastor in 2 Timothy, and says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And you guys listen to what he says then. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Do you remember Jesus said, get behind me, Satan? And in one moment, what was going on and attacking Peter in his mind was the enemy. The temptation to be ashamed of Jesus Christ in this world is strong. And let's just say that clear. And that needs to be said in your life and mine. That temptation, and I love that it's a temptation because it comes from the enemy. Every time the Holy Spirit moves you or I to do anything for the Lord or to especially to speak for him, the enemy will be there right away to tell us, now is not a good time, don't do this, be afraid, whatever, and try to back us off from that. And have you ever been backed away? I have. I have. Wait a minute. And then how does that feel? Right? If that temptation is real, and it is, and it's strong, that's why Paul wrote that. If it wasn't a real temptation, and Timothy hadn't felt it, and Paul himself hadn't felt it, then Paul wouldn't have written, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and told Timothy, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. So that's part of the battle. And we're ending with that. We need the Lord. We need to humble ourselves. We need to pick up our cross, deny ourselves, realize it's all him. And we need to draw near to him. We know the battle is intensifying in the world, in war, but spiritually it's intensifying. Part of that battle, it's all about the the gospel, you guys. It's all about the hearts of men and boys, women and girls. And everything that's happening, the enemy's trying to do in your life and mine is to keep us away from what God is trying to do and distract us from and forgetting that what's really important are people's hearts and that they would know the Lord. So the night he's arrested before they go out to the garden, Jesus says to Peter, Satan is asked to sift you as wheat. You're going to fail. But I've prayed for you and when you return to me, strengthen your brother. And Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster should not not crow twice. uh, Mark says, this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. 
Now remember, this was the man who boldly, uncompromisingly said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of God. So that night, the Lord says, you're going to fail. Satan himself has asked for you personally to sift you, to try you, and you're going to fail, he's telling Peter. Peter. And Peter says, no, I'm ready. And Jesus says, you will deny. Three words, I am ready. You will deny. I'm the greatest. I love you more than anyone. You will deny. And you guys, we know that he did deny the Lord. So he follows the Lord when he's arrested. He goes into the court of the high priest. He's standing at the enemy's fire. And three times he denies the Lord. And uh, when that happens, three times when he denies the Lord, dramatically three things happen at the same time. Number one, the rooster crows for the second time and he hears it. He remembers the prediction of Jesus' words, and as he remembers, you know what happens? Both Jesus and Peter turn and look at each other. So it's as if Jesus is over there, and I'm Peter, and I just denied the Lord at the fire. And as I deny him, and the cock crows the second time, and I remember the words of the Lord, I turn because I know they have the Lord over there waiting to go in, for trial, and as I turn, he turns and looks at me, and our eyes look at each other. And you remember the story today? On the road, he said, he rebuked the Lord, and he said, he grabs him, turns him around, looks him in the eye, and says, not so, Lord, right? And Jesus turns him around, and he's looking him in the eye, and he says to the disciples, get behind me, Satan. Now, he says, he's going to sift you as wheat. You're going to fail, and he did and, uh, and you and I can too. And that's why Paul says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And, um, and so, you guys, we got to be careful and we got to be on guard and we got to look to the Lord and we got to lean on him for all of our strength. Amen. So, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your head right now, and no one looking at me. And David's going to come up in a moment and close us in the last song in prayer. But I want to give you an opportunity right now to get right with the Lord and to receive him. And if you want to be saved and have your sins forgiven and go to heaven and have Jesus come and live within, then you need to have your confession inside and you need to believe that he is God. You need to believe that you're a sinner and admit it. You need to believe that he died on the cross for your sins and you need to be willing to turn from your life of sin right now and turn fully to him. And what he requires, you'll be saved, but then what he requires is you pick up your cross immediately and deny yourself and obey him for the rest of your life. Not that you might be saved. You'll be saved that you might in love obey him now. Do you want to do that this morning? I'm going to say a prayer. And ask you to very quietly, just to yourself, whisper it within in your mind and heart, but whisper it to our risen Lord Jesus who is here right now. And you will be asking him to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior. And he will do that and save you and wash away your sins. If in a brand new, fresh way, you who know you are a believer here this morning, hear the Spirit And hear the Son of God, our Lord Jesus, through his Spirit, asking you, who do you say that I am? And you want to renew your love to him in a brand new way this morning. You have a private moment with him right now and pray also to him. So please just repeat after me silently now this prayer. The Lord's looking at your heart to see if you truly believe in him. (coughs) And if you do, he'll save you. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are God. Lord, I know that I am a sinner. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for my sins. I turn from my life of sin now, Lord, from all of it. And I want to now follow you. I can't do it on my own, Lord. Please come into my heart right now and be my Lord and Savior. And I will, Lord, deny myself, pick up my cross, and follow you every day from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord.